right, thanks, Meg. Um, so first, uh, technical checks. Uh, let me just make sure that you can see you can see my first slide. Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. All right. So I shared the right screen. Um, <clears throat> thank you um, all for uh, inviting me, and um, I'm going to tell a little bit about where we are with solar system processing. Um, what is the current status? What have we been doing over the past uh, half a year or so, and what are the plans going forward? So if you've seen my talk uh, in Lyon last week, um, you will notice some similarities. Uh, this is, in, in essence, an expanded version of that talk, so, so some apologies in advance for um, maybe hearing again certain things you've heard last week. Uh, but uh, think of that as a chance to, to ask questions um, in case uh, any of that was not, uh, was not clear. Um, so the, the solar system, I thought I would start First, uh, with a little bit of a bit more broader introduction into um, why is it, what is it that we're pursuing here, and why is it that we're pursuing this uh, this area of science, um, given the broader presentation we have across all the science collaborations here. Um, so uh, the the solar system itself is a fairly diverse place. Um, I made a joke last week. I said when I you know, started in this business, the solar system consisted of four or five types of objects um, that were all nicely, clearly delineated. You knew what a comet was. You knew what a, um, an asteroid was. Things are a lot more complicated today, um, as you can see by this uh, diagram that I found up on Wikipedia of all places. Um, but it's quite useful. Um, and it's good they're complicated because the um, the science is complicated and all these overlaps and things we're discovering in the solar system are telling us a lot about the solar system um, structure, formation, and uh, and its evolution. So when we say, the reason why I bring this up here is uh, when we say solar system science um, in LSST, uh, most of what we're thinking about is the science is going to be coming from uh, small bodies of the solar system and dwarf planets. Um, so there might be uh, uh, science related to 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 uh, the, the major planets. Um, there will definitely be um, uh, the science related to satellites of planets, uh, but that is not largely what I'm focusing on here. For for the purposes of this presentation, anything moving in the solar system, but uh, moving around the sun, so in heliocentric orbit. Uh, qualifies as a solar system object, and we will uh, try to, to handle it appropriately. Other things that are moving uh, will likely be detected as such, but we will not try to, we will not attempt to, to fit anything other than heliocentric orbits. So, um, most of what we'll be looking at are, are asteroids and their uh, larger cousins, uh, the, the dwarf planets. So, asteroids in the solar system. Are, uh, here's a, a nice, um, a very nice montage of, um, I think at the point when this was made, all the asteroids that um, were visited by space probes. So roughly to give you a scale, uh, the uh, 21 Letitia that's uh, shown on the left is about 130 by 100 kilometers. Um, and so if you, if you tried to put a you know, a major city on Earth into, onto one of these, uh, it would probably fit into a, a larger crater there. So they're rocks, mountains, uh, whatever you want to call them, in uh, in the solar that are zipping through the solar system. Now that is um, one of the interesting aspects here. So most asteroids are uh, between uh, in the in the main belt uh, of main asteroid belt of the solar system between uh, Mars and Jupiter. Um, you see in this uh, animation by Alex Parker of uh, of asteroids that were these colors were measured by SDSS. You also see two swarms around Jupiter, and there are a number of other dwarf planets that are further out that are that are not on this uh, on this here, on this uh, animation here. Um, the reason why I'm showing you this is one of the big things we we'll want to understand with LSST is, first of all, make a census of of asteroids both in the main belt, uh, near Earth asteroids, as well as as well as um, uh, objects in the Kuiper belt and beyond and understand their orbits, understand their motions. The reason why we want to do that, um, there are a number of reasons, but let me give you a couple that are, uh, that are, I think, highly compelling to a broader audience. One is that 
where the asteroids are in the solar system and uh, even more so where the asteroids are not in the solar system tells us something about the history, especially early history of the solar system. So I think this was brought to the forefront um, a couple of years ago, um, almost uh, more than half a decade ago, with uh, the with, uh, class of models that uh, began with the NICE model of solar system evolution that looked at um, the, the evolution of the solar system starting with conditions that looked very differently from what we observe today in the solar system. So what you see here in these three panels, on the left-hand side is the uh, potential initial condition of the solar system where all the planets were fairly tightly packed, um, fairly close to the sun. So you'll notice that um, everything out, the, including Uranus and Neptune, are within 20 AU. And then you have a dynamical instability event that causes these planets to spread out, that causes the asteroids, and um, I should be more careful, um, dwarf planets that are out there to be um, this, uh, disrupted from their orbits, uh, many of them ejected. And what's left, what you have left out here is you have the solar system as we know it today and the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt um, as we see them today. And the way how this came about was uh, as, uh, as folks in Nice were trying to explain the observables, a number of the observables in the solar system, uh, essentially orbits that are observed in the Kuiper belt um, uh, including events such as late heavy bombardment, and realize that uh, this kind of a dynamical instability event early on in the history of the solar system uh, explains it all. So this would not be possible without having a fairly complete census of the solar system and without having a lot of information about um, the, the orbital, uh, the, the characteristics of the orbital distribution of, of uh, everything from asteroids to minor planets to comets. Um, a more recent example of uh, how these, this kind of information uh, that we're going to get from the census of the solar system is going to be tremendously useful are uh, potential hints for an existence of another planet um, on the outskirts of the solar system. It's been occasionally called Planet X or Planet 9. The, the, the story here is that um, based on looking at orientation of uh, certain ends on, on uh, the, the, the uh, what is it called, um, the perihelia of, of orbits of uh, certain um, dwarf planets in the, uh, on the outside, uh, in, in the outer solar system, um, they seem to be in fairly non-random uh, locations in orbital space that points to something, to there being something that has placed them um, into those locations uh, by, through uh, gravitational interactions. And so that is um, the evidence that points to there potentially being a new planet. Um, and we talk, when we say new planet, we, we're not thinking about something uh, the scale of, of, of Pluto, but something, think about something more the scale of Earth or the ice giants. Um, looking for this, planet or potentially finding it uh, would be a major, I think, um, contribution to the understanding of this whole system and uh, one of the quite interesting uh, potential things for, uh, for LSST if it's not uh, found or, or um, disproved uh, before. So again, the reason why we can infer um, uh, hints of existence of, of new and interesting things out there in the solar system is because we have cataloged a large number of orbits of uh, small bodies in the solar system. Um, this story goes beyond the solar system. So last year in October, uh, this object was discovered, the first um, discovered interstellar object passing through the solar system. It is certainly not the first interstellar object passing through the solar system, it's just the one, it's just one that we've, uh, we've seen first. And this was an interesting um, discovery because we essentially had, we the community essentially had only a couple of weeks to do all the observations uh, that could be done on this, on this object uh, before it left. Because uh, it, it came in on a hyperbolic orbit and it uh, spent a very little time in the solar system. It was actually discovered on its way out. So with LSST, the hope is, um, depending on the model, um, to find anywhere between one and dozens or a hundred of these objects. Um, and uh, either way, even in the first year of LSST, uh, some interesting constraints are likely going to be put on, uh, on these kinds of objects. 
Uh, why are they interesting? Uh, because if we can find them early, if we can observe them, uh, they give us a, a hint of what they've gone through in their uh, origin in the planetary system they originated from, uh, which makes them highly interesting. And now going back closer to Earth, um, this was uh, one of the big motivating factors early on for LSST. Um, it's the NEOs and planetary defense. So what I'm showing you here uh, is a video from uh, an event above a place called Chelyabinsk in Russia that happened on uh, February 15, 2013. Um, in this uh, case, a fairly small uh, meteor entered the atmosphere above Chelyabinsk, about uh, roughly about 20 meters or so, um, and uh, caused uh, quite a lot of damage. Um, um, the light from the meteor was um, you know, the usual story, fairly brighter from the sun, uh, visible, brighter than the sun, visible more than 100 kilometers away. Uh, but the interesting thing to me was that um, it, uh, it exploded in the atmosphere, but the, the damage that it caused on the ground uh, made about more than 1,000 people seek um, 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 assistance in uh, emergency rooms, um, typically due to uh, broken glass and, and things of that sort. If a larger object did this over a more populated area, over a major city, um, you can imagine that that would be a fairly uh, bad day for everyone. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that um, uh, the asteroid community has been working on over the last couple of decades is to try to find and identify these kinds of objects. And LSSD is going to uh, bring a major new resource uh, for, these, uh, for these types of, of studies. Okay, final thing in this little tour of, of asteroid science and opportunities um, is something new, something that may um, look, um, to be honest, a, a little bit on the science fiction side, but uh, less so with every day. And the, the idea here is to actually go and mine resources from these, uh, from these asteroids. So what I'm showing you here is a um, slide produced by a, um, actually a local company here in, in Seattle area, Planetary Resources. Um, who are planning to try to, to go to uh, one of the nearby asteroids um, and, uh, and understand how its resources can be mined, either for further exploration of the solar system uh, or for, uh, to bring them back uh, to Earth. So you have everything from uh, getting water for uh, solar system missions uh, to uh, bringing back precious metals. Um, and these kinds of things are actually becoming feasible uh, with, uh, with advancements in rocketry that we've been witnessing over the past um, Couple of uh, couple of years, so discovering small asteroids near Earth uh, might give us opportunities that go beyond science and beyond planetary defense that uh, honestly we haven't been thinking about uh, up until a few years ago. So, what will LSST discover, or what is LSST expected to discover? Um, in all these classes of objects, LSST is going to make contribution in some more than the other, but um, even the, the smallest quote unquote smallest contribution that we're going to make uh, in main belt asteroid is going to increase the number of known asteroids uh, by almost an order of magnitude. So this uh, currently known number is slightly uh, slightly out of date now. There are about 700,000 known main belt asteroids. And depending on what we assume for the model, we're going to, um, uh, with LST, we're going to see anywhere between five and a half million and uh, going all the way up to 10. Um, Jupiter Trojans, it will increase the numbers dramatically and uh, transituting, and it's going to be a fantastic machine for discovery of transituting objects. So this is, these are the capabilities of the LSST. Um, what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of the talk is how do we make data products like we do with uh, everything else in LSST? How do we make data products that enable um, scientists uh, downstream of the LSST project to um, actually take these asteroids and either um, and, uh, and and turn that um, um, uh, turn that uh, that raw information on you know, here is an asteroid in the solar system into into science. So LSST will produce the way I like to think about it is when it comes to the solar system, the LSST will provide three types of data products that enable uh, solar system science. Um, one or two of them fall into the class of prompt products, uh, what we used to call level one, and then the, uh, the third are the data release products. 
So I'm going to go through um, all the, through these three types and uh, tell a little bit uh, about each one of them. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail about the changes we're planning to make uh, to how we, how we build the daily orbit catalog, which I think is going to be the most interesting uh, thing here to, uh, to the solar system folks uh, in the collaborations. Um, so I've, I've uh, usually when I would give this or a talk similar to this uh, earlier, I would just say there are two types of data products. There, there's the orbit catalog, and there, there are things that are really going to be doing in uh, in in the data release processing. Uh, but I, I feel that that um, actually um, hides certain things that we're going to be doing at an even um, um, even more real time scales, um, and uh, that is the ability to quickly identify and follow up fast moving objects by looking at, uh, at trails, L trail, trail objects or streaks. So, so that's why I've now started separating this and talking about three types of data products. Um, just to bring your attention to the fact that, um, as you know, there will be a real time data stream of uh, alerts coming from LSST within 60 seconds of, uh, of each observation. And in that data stream, uh, we'll have the usual measurements of um, you know, centroid astrometry, uh, PSF photometry, aperture photometry, and so on. But we will also have measurement in that in that real-time stream of uh, of what we call the trailed source models. So to each observation, we will fit a model of an object that's moving, and uh, we will fit for uh, the the best fit um, uh, direction of motion and uh, the magnitude of motion. So in effect will tell you if this object is moving, um, how fast it's moving, and what direction. So by comparing the, um, uh, the, 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 for example, the quality of the fit in this trail source model with the quality of the fit in the point source model or uh, with what the aperture uh, photometry is telling you, it will be fairly straightforward to identify trail sources uh, like the one I'm showing here um, on, on the image, on, uh, like an example I'm showing here on the image on the, on the right and react to them immediately. So I think this is um, this is one of the one of the, the potential things that that is still fairly unexplored on the LSSD side. Um, and uh, uh, ZTF, which uh, tr is trying to test some of these ideas that we have for LSSD, um, has uh, um, is doing something like this and has actually put it to really good use and is, is finding uh, NEOs quite successfully by by looking at these uh, trail objects. Um, almost in real time. So this will be coming out um, every within 60 seconds of observation. Um, on a daily cadence, uh, based on what we currently have in the baseline, now I'll talk about the changes in just a second, uh, we will be producing an orbit catalog or uh, we'll be detecting objects that, that are not easy to identify as asteroids just based on a single observation because they don't trail. They, truly look like stars. And we will uh, link those objects together um, into, um, into orbits um, and then produce that catalog of orbits and their physical properties um, essentially on a daily basis. So uh, based on the current baseline, um, and again, the caveat is that um, I'll tell you something about the changes in, in just a few minutes, but uh, here's what the current documentation is, is telling us. Uh, every night, we will, at the end of every night, we will take all the objects that were discovered in that night and over the previous couple of weeks, uh, or sorry, we should, I should say, we will take all the detections that we cannot associate to static objects um, over that night and over the previous uh, couple of weeks. We'll take those detections, we will find those that, that are consistent with being a, a moving object um, on a heliocentric orbit. Uh, we'll associate those into um, into into associations of objects that into associations of observations that correspond to one what we call solar system object. We'll compute an orbit for that solar system object, and we'll compute some physical properties of that object based on on the photometry uh, we will be getting from LSST. So things like uh, absolute magnitudes, uh, or and so later on when there's enough information, uh, enough auxiliary information, perhaps things like slope parameters. Um, the, the reason why we are building this catalog, I think, are, are, are important to, to understand. Um, the, one of the primary reasons is that uh, we want to, to, to have an up-to-date catalog um, uh, on a essentially nightly basis as opposed to every month or every year uh, because we want to enable follow-up of, 
of these objects. Um, if, an, if an interesting object is discovered, we want to know about it uh, early on so as, so as to enable follow-up. The second reason is that what we want to do is uh, enable association of uh, objects as soon as they're discovered so that they're not mistaken for, for example, interesting transients. So both of these desiderata uh, or both of these reasons um, make us want to, to have this catalog be as complete as possible. Um, and uh, this is one of the motivations in the, for the changes that, uh, that I'm going to be talking to you about in, in just a second. Um, so this happens on a daily time scale. Um, every day uh, uh, new objects are discovered. What happens on a yearly time scale is in essence, we repeat what we do every day, but with data that's of higher quality. Um, so data that's of higher quality and a, a fairly well-controlled versions of the software. So I, I should have uh, mentioned in the prompt products in the daily um, um, orbit catalog um, um, computation, because we are going to be biasing towards being as complete as possible, uh, if we discover bugs, in let's say MOPS or, uh, or you know, any of the software down, downstream that, uh, that makes us uh, incomplete or that makes the catalog um, um, say overwhelmed with, uh, with incorrect linkages or, or things like that, we will fix it as soon as possible. Um, and that is true throughout the level one system. Uh, that is kind of the, um, the, 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 the posture we've taken. Level one is to enable rapid follow-up. Therefore, if something is identified as an issue, a software fix will be made to, to fix it as soon as possible. Now that means that over a course of the year you may have um, a number of software uh, changes that are going to affect things like uh, selection functions of, of the survey. And that will all make it fairly difficult to understand uh, what the selection functions are and to do any kinds of statistical studies with, uh, with these uh, types of catalogs. So that is the primary motivation for data release products. In data release products, we, the goal is to provide a catalog of moving objects that truly enables uh, estimates of completeness in population studies, where the selection function is well quantified, well understood, uh, that's generated with a single version of MOPS, that takes advantage of improved photometry and astrometry that's available in data release processing. And um, uh, this catalog will also include um, LSST only information. So what that means is, I'll tell you in a second how we're, change, how we're planning to change the, the nightly catalog. Uh, in essence, we're going to, the nightly catalog uh, will become the, the catalog that the Minor Planet Center is producing. And that catalog is not just uh, built using the information from LSST, but also from other surveys. As you can imagine, that makes it difficult to understand what the selection function of that entire catalog is. So again, in data release processing, uh, we will deliver a catalog with a well-controlled version of software, well-understood uh, um, um, uh, measurements of both photometry and, and astrometry, and using only LSSD information to, to, to enable uh, these kinds of population studies. But otherwise, the essence of this processing that happens in data release is going to be um, nearly identical to, to what we would have done um, on, a, on a nightly basis. Um, let me talk a little bit about the solar system processing flow uh, that happens every night. So this here is a is a fairly um, and a high level um, coarse grain schematic of uh, of what will be going on uh, in a night day cycle. Uh, if we start with the night side, uh, let's begin with observing. So LSST will be observing um, during the night and the the evening before. Uh, we will generate a certain, uh, you can think of them as, as help files or, or as, as cache files to allow us to rapidly associate any known objects to um, uh, uh, any objects, uh, any, to, to rapidly associate any moving objects that are already known to catalogs that LSSD has. Um, so after the observing is done, uh, any objects that are not identified with static objects or already identified with moving objects will be passed on. Any detections that are not identified with static objects or, move, or already known moving objects will be passed on to MOPS. Uh, MOPS is the moving object processing system. Uh, it's a piece of software that uh, then takes those detections and attempts to 
to link them um, into, into uh, candidates for, for moving objects in the solar system. Um, those linkages, so MOPS will take those linkages at the end of the night, or take those uh, observations at the end of the night, attempt to do linkages, and then do two things. Like This is according to the current baseline. One thing that it's going to do is it will report um, any new linkages to the minor planet center the way that is customary and, uh, and done today uh, by all uh, surveys, all asteroid surveys. And the second thing it's going to do is to use those candidates or to add those candidates to a catalog that LSST would um, preserve and maintain internally off moving objects. So those linked object candidates are added to the catalog then the catalog itself that um, you know, will start accumulating uh, more and more um, uh, linked objects and orbits uh, will undergo a, what we call a recomputation step where we look at all the newly discovered orbits, we'll look at the orbits uh, that uh, we already have in the catalog and try to understand which ones might go together in the sense that you may have had an object that you observed three years ago that corresponds to an object that was rediscovered yesterday, but not initially um, understood as such as a rediscovery, but mistaken for a new for a new object. So there's a lot of book for a new object. So there's a lot of the bookkeeping that goes into that. That is um, uh, that that's what uh, what this uh, what this uh, um, uh, circle circle or arrow is is meant to to convey. But at the end of of that process, uh, new objects are incorporated into the the orbit of uh, into the orbit catalog that LSST maintains. The orbit catalog is made public. The orbit catalog goes into the ephemeris pre-computation stage. Here we pre-compute which objects we, we believe we're going to see the next night, and then those are used to associate objects in the night. So this is roughly the, the nightly loop. Um, you have observing, you have MOPS trying to find uh, new objects, you have those new objects added to the orbit catalog, with the catalog recomputed. Um, to, to, to keep it um, as correct as possible. And then using that catalog, we try to associate new objects. Uh, we, try to, we try to associate already known objects um, next night we observe. And this goes on um, every, every day or every day and night. There are certain, there's a number of issues with uh, this scheme that uh, as we started implementing it, we, 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 we became, uh, we, we started understanding it more and more. Um, one is that uh, one issue is that the arrow going to the minor planet center in here is uh, is one way. So in essence, we report to the minor planet center, but we do not um, ingest back uh, or, or not explicitly ingest back the data from the minor planet center about, um, uh, for example, designations uh, that uh, that that minor planet center assigns and so on. So. We have found ways to, to work around that, um, to associate both objects, um, every single object that's discovered, we could associate it with the internal LSST orbit catalog and the minor planet center designation. But the, the more we thought about it, the more um, um, it turned into a bookkeeping headache, and not just for us, but for, for scientists downstream who are meant to use this catalog. Um, in essence, um, you would have to, you would have to understand, or you would have there would be four options in, for example, in each alert on whether an asteroid would be associated with an LSST catalog, with the minor planet center catalog, um, with both, with neither. Then there will be interesting potential problems if uh, you know, a minor planet center links asteroids one way, LSST internal links asteroids another way, and uh, many corner cases that would need to be resolved that would, uh, that would simply um, cause headaches uh, down, down the down, downstream. Um, Another problem here was that we didn't plan to cross-reference the LSST catalog to the minor planet center catalog. So this was left <clears throat> to, to the community. So everybody would have to write essentially the same code to establish that um, some, some ID in the LSST catalog is really um, a, an, an asteroid from, uh, from the minor planet center catalog. And those kinds of codes are usually fairly easy, except when they're not. Uh, in corner cases, again, um, there, are, there are going to be problems. And the, the biggest problem here, at least in my view, is that tracklets, we have mops that links tracklets into potential asteroids, and tracklets that are never linked would never get reported essentially anywhere. 
um, definitely not to the minor planet center. So the objects where LSST's tracklet could be linked to, for example, a tracklet from another survey become lost. And, and that is something that you know, we haven't quantitatively evaluated how much of a difference this would make, but it may be an order of a couple of percent um, and certainly worth uh, pursuing. So we looked at whether we could do better and started discussions about this uh, almost a year ago, uh, both with the Minor Planet Center and uh, with the folks in this Solar System Science Collaboration, and uh, came up with, uh, with this scheme instead. So if you look at the previous uh, plot that I've shown you, or the previous um, um, uh, diagram that I showed you, the difference is that now instead of the two boxes on the day side, we have three. And one of those boxes is recompute MPC orb and it's called differently because it would happen at the minor planet center. So the idea now is to do observing, to collect observations, um, to, to take all the observations that are not associated to static objects, to pass them on to MOPS on the LSSD side, have MOPS discover candidate, um, candidate uh, linkages, but then instead of us computing the final orbit for those linkages, we would submit those linkages to the minor planet center. Uh, the same way that all surveys presently that are operating at, uh, at present, um, especially the asteroid surveys, the NEO surveys um, do. So we would pass that to the minor planet center. The minor planet center would take that, would recompute the, their orbit catalog, their internal orbit catalog um, within, a, within a day. Um, they will republish that orbit catalog, incorporate LSST observation, incorporate all the other observations that may be happening at the same time, so any other project that, uh, that may be going at the same time, generate a new minor planet center uh, MPC orbit catalog, um, put it out there, we would ingest it um, into LSST, um, we would get our orbit information from that catalog, we would compute on top of the orbit information, we would compute all the physical characteristics that, are, uh, that come from LSST um, uh, photometry, uh, in essence. So things like um, uh, absolute magnitudes and such. Um, and then we would use that as the catalog for uh, ephemeris pre-computation uh, to support observing uh, the next night. So if you're thinking about what does that change in, uh, for the sources and data products, it makes a change uh, in the, 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 the sense that the LSST um, orbit catalog that we had before, the SS object table um, in uh, the, the, the DPDD, uh, you, you can think of that now as being split into two. The orbital information that, uh, that was present in the, in the SS object table um, and that uh, we thought we would, or we were, were planning to compute would now come from the MPC ORP catalog. So they would be computing that for us. And that orbital information would include, um, again, not just LSST, but um, all, uh, all the information that's, uh, that's at that time available to, to the MPC. And then the other half of that table, the various physical quantities um, um, would, be, would still be computed. It's just that the source of the, the linkages um, is, uh, is, is now becoming, is now coming from, or the, uh, I should say, the, the orbital information is coming from the MPC, and we use that information to, to, um, to determine which LSST observation belongs to a given asteroid and compute the physical, compute the physical uh, properties for the asteroid. So that is really the, the change. Um, on the data release product side, uh, not much changes. I think, in essence, nothing changes because on the data release product side, we still uh, will compute an LSST only um, orbit uh, database um, and compute the physical quantities the same way that, uh, that we did before. So why do we do this? Uh, we think that this brings significant improvements. So first of all, the orbit catalog that's used for association uh, in any given night is now maximally complete at all times. We, we had this base zero problem in that if we observed Ceres, the, you know, the, the largest asteroid there is out there on, on day zero of, of LCT observations, we would think it's a new asteroid. Um, the, 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 the attempts to fix that, or, or one could fix that by um, uh, associating, by saying we're going to associate both against the LCT internal catalog and the minor planet center catalog, 
But as I mentioned, that brings all kinds of bookkeeping problems that this neatly avoids. So for everyone not in the SAS collaboration, I think this is excellent news because this means that uh, we will be much more successful at removing contaminants for all kinds of all other kinds of science, um, for example, supernova effects, transients, and so on, because this catalog is going to be significantly more complete. Um, it solves the cross-matching problems. There now isn't anything to cross-match. There's no need to cross-match two orbit catalogs. Um, it reduces, I think, community confusion. There will not be an, an LSST catalog and an MPC catalog. There will be just a catalog of objects in the solar system. And I think it, it's nicely consistent with, uh, with what's happening um, um, these days and, and uh, where, uh, where I think uh, something that will make, that will make I think, everybody's uh, life easier. Um, this one is, I think, fairly interesting because uh, people are always, always wonder, how do I actually work with LSST data? Um, and how do I access it? What's the LSST science platform going to look like, et cetera? Well, it turns out that with this change, if, uh, if or whether, whether one will need to significantly change their tooling to work with LSST data, because, for example, different formats. And with this change, we become standardized. Um, there is nothing special to take advantage of, nothing special to be done to take advantage of LSST data, if, especially if all one cares are about the orbits. It's essentially all in the minor planet center's orbit catalog. Um, if you have tooling that works with the MPC, um, it will just work. It will just continue to work, except that that catalog will start growing uh, significantly when LSST data starts coming in. And I think it makes our data much more accessible and useful, um, even beyond the black belts uh, that, um, that have been thinking about this for a while now. Um, it also places LSST into a more general framework of how survey, surveys operate today, um, especially um, uh, so, so virtually all the observations are, are sent to the Minor Planet Center for um, incorporation into their databases. Uh, we now become a part of that framework rather than as a rather than a separate thing on the side. The it's worth to to understand a little bit of history there. That the reason why LSST built uh, or planned to build so much internal infrastructure that replicates in many ways what the Minor Planet Center already does was because at the time LSST was conceived, the volumes of data that that were being talked about uh, were, were something that was just impossible to handle at the Minor Planet Center. In the meantime, you know, LSST is coming uh, almost a decade later than when, when it was originally envisioned and when these plans were drawn up. Um, Moore's Law works to our advantage. The Minor Planet Center has actually expanded significantly uh, over the same uh, time period. Um, and other surveys have uh, in, uh, shown that um, they, they are actually capable of intaking a significant uh, amount of data so a lot of the work that they did to prepare for PenStars will translate over to LSST. Um, and so we can just plug into a lot of that framework. Um, interestingly, it also opens up the possibility for us to submit all tracklets to the MPC, including trails. So they're very interested to, to relax their requirement for tracklets to essentially be 100% um, real. Uh, most of our trackers are going to be probabilistic. They'll have some probability of, of actually being real or, or being uh, misassociations. And we're driving some of that evolution at the, at the MPC um, that will allow them to intake, in essence, everything that we have. And that allows uh, not just the Minor Planet Center, but the entire asteroid community to begin looking at things like cross-survey linking. So imagine the first discovery being made, the first tracklet, uh, the, the first two pairs of observations being made by LSST, the, the second two pairs being made perhaps by PanStars, and the last two pairs uh, being made by, um, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just make something up, um, uh, let's say W first, just to be uh, um, exotic. <laughs> um, Right now, those kinds of discoveries would uh, would not be a discovery uh, because they're they're in separate databases. If you send send everything, if you have everything in the same database and allow everyone to, to try to establish those kind of linkages, um, that will allow a much um, uh, significantly more complete um, discovery process. Now, um, the, the second set of advantages that that we have here is that uh, we. We also, by, by doing this, we also evolve together with the MPC and drive some of their evolution. 
So one of the things that we'll be driving is that um, there are going to be, um, we're going to be devising a new orbit format uh, for this orbit catalog that includes covariances, that um, a format that is much more applicable and, uh, uh, and I can say applicable, uh, much easier to use also for, uh, for things like um, um, Kuiper belt objects uh, with short arcs. We need this internally to, to compute reasonable error ellipses really for, for association, um, but this is going to have, I think, a much more broader impact um, uh, community-wide uh, because this is the kind of information that, that's being asked for for a while now. We'll be pushing for some updates to the ADAS data exchange format, um, updates such as uh, the, the ability to, to support probabilistic tracklet associations, so in essence to assign a probability to each tracklet to make it possible to have each observation be assigned associated to in many tracklets. Uh, we'll be updating uh, that format. I uh, apologize, I have a, a, a buck there. It's not updated to the catalog format, updated to the, to the ADES XML format. Um, and we're also driving some of the improvements to the MPC services. So they'll be um, coming out with an improved and downloadable MP checker, the, um, uh, in essence, a, a, a piece of code that allows you to quickly compute which asteroids are in your field, on the field of view. Uh, and we have some ideas on how to do standardized pre-compute, on how to develop standardized pre-compute position formats. So once this is pre-computed, any survey can, can essentially use the same tool and, and download uh, these pre-computed files in the same format. So bottom line, I think here is that we'll benefit from this work that the MPC does uh, for the broader community, uh, but also we will it'll, it'll go vice versa as well. So the the, uh, the broader community will benefit from the work that we do in in our understanding uh, um, of of what's needed to support these uh, these kinds of scales of, of observations um, and uh, and numbers of asteroids that uh, we're going to discover. Okay. So um, this is ongoing, um, and uh, we have just started to uh, to put this into into documents that we're going to start circulating uh, over the summer in the collaboration. So we expect a lot of feedback there. I presented an early version of this in uh, in uh, in Utah at the DPS meeting. Um, um, incorporated a lot of that feedback back. Um, it was generally positive. We'll continue doing that. I want to make sure that we come up with something that we can both do given the resources that we have on the LSST side and it's going to be useful to the, to the community. Um, so I have a couple of slides with uh, updates on, on where we are with MOPS um, and then I'll, uh, I'll open it up uh, uh, for questions. So MOPS is the, the part that, uh, the, the software pipeline that takes the newly collected observations um, and, uh, and tries to link them, uh, tries to put them together associate uh, individual source detections um, to, to a single moving object that's uh, going through the solar system. Um, you've probably seen this slide a number of times already, how uh, what, the, what the current strategy is to discover uh, new asteroids. Uh, in essence, we, we do two observations every night uh, with the hope that that will generate a tracklet. So uh, two nearby observations of the same asteroid that uh, can be associated relatively unambiguously. So when you accumulate at least three nights worth of tracklets, um, you can try to, um, in essence, draw a line through them, uh, extrapolate from the first one to the next one, and then from those two to the next one, and so on, uh, up until the point where you're confident enough that you have a potential association uh, that you go ahead and do initial uh, orbit termination and differential orbit termination, and, and uh, send it to the minor planet center. The issue with, uh, with this algorithm has, uh, has always been that if you are overwhelmed by false positives um, and an image difference saying that that's a possibility, uh, NSTARS famously had, uh, had issues with that uh, because of the, the, the hardware issues on the camera, uh, you might be overwhelmed by the numbers of tracklets, by the potential, by the combinatorics of the problem, the, the, uh, the, the need to, to try to link every possible to try to check every possible linkage, and uh, that leads to a fairly um, inconvenient scaling that goes something like uh, um, O n cubed for uh, the number of tracklets. Um, so we spent uh, a lot of time over the past couple of years uh, trying to assess how well LSSD is going to do uh, in, in this area, um, and I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, this paper that uh, Lynn Jones has been leading has, been, has now been published. Um, it's, it's in Icarus. Uh, the bottom line is that our conclusion is that MOPS 
will satisfy uh, LSST moving object linking requirements. There was a uh, nearly simultaneous paper by um, uh, Steve Chesley and Peter Verish, um, then at JPL, now, now Peter's at MPC, uh, who've done the same kind of study. We're using the same algorithm, but a different implementation and reach the same conclusion. So we're now fairly confident that, that this will just work and now we're moving on to, uh, to, to implementation. Um, just a quick um, snapshot uh, for those who are interested in, in LSST as an NEO discovery machine. NEO stands for Near Earth Objects. Um, how well will LSST do with, with NEOs? Um, the baseline survey already uh, will find uh, about 73% um, of, of all known NEOs. Uh, you know, again, this is a fairly model dependent statement, but uh, using models that are, that are presently available, 81% uh, of PAJs. Um, and then we also looked in this paper what would happen if we um, changed the survey, extended it to 12 years with some changes, um, and how would that change the discovery rates? Uh, we're able to show that PJ discovery rate would, would go up by uh, something like uh, five percentage points. The way to think about these numbers actually is not that it goes up by five percentage points, but you need to you should subtract 100 minus this number. So what this means is that 20% of the population will be unknown. And what this means is that 40% of the population would remain unknown. Uh, sorry, 14%. So, so that means that this, this change would discover a quarter um, asteroids that were quarter, quarter PHAs that would otherwise uh, be uh, remain undiscovered. So if you're if you really are in planetary defense mode and you're trying to discover all of them, it's actually not insignificant. It's a, it's quite a significant number. Um, the, the, the MOPS algorithm that I mentioned, I think we're fairly confident that it's going to work, uh, but um, that hasn't stopped the, the community to, to think about improvements. Uh, we've been thinking about them as well. Um, there's been a paper recently by um, Matt Holman, Matt Payne, and, uh, and colleagues uh, from the CFA, from, from NPC, uh, presenting a new way to, to do linkages. Um, so in, in essence, what they point out is if one transforms the origin of, of observation to the sun instead of the Earth, the, um, the apparent track of an asteroid on the sky or in, in these projections uh, stops being fairly nonlinear, as you can see it here, and turns into something that's uh, more like a line. And then based on uh, the, the, the fact that you have a tracklet, therefore you have an estimate of, of the motion, you can project all those tracklets onto some into some reference time, turn them into clusters, and fairly easily uh, discover asteroids and turn your, your asteroid uh, linkage problem into a cluster finding problem. Um, and this changes the scaling from O n cubed to uh, O n log n, um, uh, as, as this paper um, 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 presents. So that would be significant improvement over what we have now. Um, and this is something that we're definitely looking into. Um, it's very likely that we're going to adopt this algorithm. We've been talking to, to Matt about this for, for a while now. Uh, but I think it's still, we still need to demonstrate and evaluate its performance in LSD-like conditions. Their, their paper was, uh, was fairly, um, uh, didn't really go into much detail uh, on how false positives might affect uh, these scalings and so on. So, so we're quite optimistic that um, this, that major advances can be made in, in, in linking um, uh, beyond uh, MOPS. Um, so this brings me to my last uh, few slides, just to give you an idea of what are we doing going forward and what have we done recently. Um, so one of the big things that, that we're doing is we're, we're increasing or enlarging our team. Um, so at the moment, uh, the, the, the solar system, um, LSC solar system DN team consists of, of uh, Joachim Moens, uh, who's a graduate student uh, here at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, at present, he's about 40% uh, on, on, on working on, on MOPS. Um, I am uh, um, about 25%. Uh, I will be, in the long run, I'll be uh, working on this 25% of my time. Uh, over the summer, uh, it's actually be bumped up to um, something closer than, than full time, in order of uh, 75, 80 percent, uh, just to get things started. And the key person here, I think, is a, a senior postdoc that uh, who we've already identified a, a very good candidate for hire 
um, uh, who we hope to, to bring in uh, fairly soon um, and uh, who work on this uh, full time. So it's a fairly small team, uh, but uh, we're definitely um, trying to um, be creative uh, in how we deliver things and, uh, and deliver everything that, uh, that we're hoping to, to deliver for the community. Um, we also get support, of course, from the broader DM team. And uh, one person I would especially mention here is Lynn Jones, uh, who's the LCC performance scientist, who's been donating a lot of her free time um, to, to just uh, get this running, uh, to, to, get us, uh, to, to get us further along in, in all the LSST, in all the, the solar system work uh, than we otherwise uh, would. Um, so over the past six months, over the past period, um, there has, uh, maybe I should start from the, from the back of this slide or from the bottom of this slide. Uh, due to various scheduling constraints, we've had uh, only we, we essentially uh, paused a lot of the work on the solar system. So we had only, I looked uh, at it today, roughly 0.1 FTE working on the solar system over the past six months on average. Uh, but we did manage to steal some cycles from other efforts and, and uh, keep, thing, uh, keep things moving, uh, moving along. So we had a major meeting with the MPC in December. Uh, we have an internal memo with about 24 actions that came out of that. We'll publish a technical note later this month with the summary of those, of, of those actions. Uh, we have been working with JPL on initial orbit determination. Um, uh, we've incorporated the code that uh, Davide Fernocha wrote for us, um, a Python implementation of, of IOD. I had a week log visit uh, by Siegfried Egel. Um, one of the uh, JPL uh, researchers to integrate this uh, just this past month. Um, and I think the, the key thing here is we, we asked and were approved to add uh, one more person uh, to, the, to the MOPS or to the solar system team. So we, as I mentioned, we have an excellent candidate and we're looking to see if they can start as early as September and that will um, increase by a factor of few really the, uh, the, um, uh, the resources we have uh, working on, on LSST. On, uh, on analysis the asteroids. So going forward, bringing on additional person is priority number one right now. We're working to document the details of NPC plans. So we have something that we can share with the collaboration that is um, uh, in some coherent form uh, that, that can take, where we can take comments and then propose formal uh, baseline updates and changes. But we'll continue developing MOPS, so looking at this new algorithm. And uh, one of the things we'd really like to do is to deploy and test in ZTF. Uh, so there are two aspects of that. One is the real-time alert component, um, so, so looking at streaks. And uh, the other is uh, running MOPS on, on ZTF public survey data, uh, whose uh, cadence, I'm not sure if that's broadly known, is, is actually designed to mimic LSSTs. So if you want to prepare for LSST today, you should really be looking at what uh, ZTF is delivering. And uh, just to uh, drive that, uh, drive that home. I showed this slide in um, in, uh, in Lyon last week as well. Um, ZTF has uh, just started uh, publishing uh, the alerts they discover every every night. Uh, we were hoping to make it actually available in the form of a stream, but uh, the uh, we, we have the, the stream ready, but the, the public brokers are not quite there yet. Uh, there we're, we're working with them to. Um, to, to, to be ready to serve the community uh, sometime later this summer and, and in the fall. Um, in the meantime, what we've done is uh, we have uh, started putting all those alerts um, onto a website where they can be downloaded from. So if you want to see what the technology is going to look like that uh, LSST is going to be using, the, the formats, uh, the kinds of um, uh, tools you're going to have to be working with uh, to, to access the stream in real time, uh, this really is a fantastic uh, data set and a fantastic um, um, chart survey to, to, to be looking at. And again, we're, we're planning to use it to, to test a lot of these um, things uh, in uh, a lot of these things we're developing for LSST uh, ahead of time and before LSST is on the sky. So with that, uh, I, will, I will stop. I'll just mention that uh, next month is uh, the first uh, Solar System Science Collaboration Readiness Sprint, and we're looking forward to that to, to discuss uh, a lot of these things in, in a lot more uh, detail. And we're very happy to, uh, to, to essentially be back to working on Solar System Processing after about a six month we expanding this team uh, going forward. So let me stop there and uh, take some questions. Um, I guess I'll just start going down the list. So for Michael, 
Can you say something more about what specialized observing modes, especially deep drilling fields, can do for discovering KBOs or TNOs? Um, I think you may actually be the a better um, uh, person to answer that. Um, depends on what. Uh, so we can do with a lot of things. Typically, we do want that second observation at night because it removes our contamination for asteroids. I would say for me personally, I, and it's my next question, um, I care about things that are beyond 200 AU, which MOPS will not find because it won't move between an image. Um, so at least current thinking has been that you need to have that second image on one night to be able to move those things or in other ways be able to, to take out those faster moving objects. Um, so for me, some of the cadence is coming, making sure we've got that second image unless we can really show that that's not needed. Um, where I've always had at least uh, on one night two images or many, many, many images spending a week to be able to, to do that. So I think for, for outer solar system, uh, we'll get size distribution from the deep drilling fields, but we're not going to get as much about uh, finding uh, finding them or distant orbits from the deep drilling fields. We'll get that from other things like the wide survey and getting the northern ecliptic spur. Um, so getting more objects is everyone's number one science case. They'd be willing to give up light curves and other things to get um, the northern ecliptic. So I guess that's the other thing that's kind of come out of, of the community. Um, I don't know if you want to comment any more on that, Mario, or have anything else to say yeah, on that's that? A, that's a good summary. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is, is that it was not clear from uh, Eric's talk on the alert stream that, again, you will find things that MOPS doesn't link. Like, again, if I want to find Planet 9, it's sitting around beyond you know, 200 AU. MOPS will likely not find it because we won't see motion in one night. How would I search that? It sounded like the alert stream sources may not necessarily be searchable on the LSST sort of DAC, and I'm not sure if that's no, true or that, not. That's, that's not, uh, I think that must have been a misunderstanding. Uh, all the sources are going to, to be in a database, uh, in a quite searchable database. Um, and perhaps where the misunderstanding is coming from is that there's also going to be a log of all the alerts, like literally mm -hmm. the, the bytes that were sent across the wires uh, as more of a, as an archival thing. Uh, those will not be searchable, but those for those you will need to know the ID of the alert. But all the information that's in those packets so it will be in a searchable database. So, yeah. And the and DIA object or source database, whatever this is from the alert stream, that will be available nightly, or is that? I think that was the question. That's though. available in real time. In essence. Okay. Because yeah. okay. it and, sounded and like that, that, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It Sorry, sounded like it was only from uh, the way it said it was that like it wasn't clear that I guess the data from alerts would be searchable the next day. Um, I, 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 unless something has, has changed, I'm, I'm sorry, I should actually refer to Eric on this, but I, I think... He referred to you, <laughs> so the, the you might have the right answer. The, the DPDD is, is, uh, is, I think, quite clear at this moment that uh, we, we promised to make that available within 24 hours, um, and I think that the, the technical implementation is, is, in essence, that it's available immediately. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, sounds like Michael wants me to ignore his second question. Um, yes. So mine, um, and you probably already know this, um, is that uh, this is the first time that I think David and I and the community is hearing exactly what you and the MPC have planned. Um, and when everyone brings up MPC, the orb file, I, I get uh, twitches because I actually don't think it's that very good. Um, it doesn't have uncertainties and it doesn't have a lot of things that we use that, especially in outer solar system. We actually fit our own orbits and um, I've never actually used the MPC other than for if I'm doing something with a sample of I want all known objects or I want to check that I have my, one of my objects might be already known. So I don't you rely on it to fit an orbit. So it's, it's a little scary to, to feel that if I look at the current MPC orb file, it has nothing, none of those things that, that are in that data are in that that uh, sort of data based schema structure that's been proposed for LSST previously, and so that really scares me. Um, and so I'm just wondering, how is that being changed? Yeah. What's the so, timeline for telling us? So, so um, I think that, and when when is this all going to be finalized and really available? So 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 we presented um, kind of a draft of this um, back in, in October, and then we had the we had meeting with MPC um, on on in December. In essence, to, to figure that out, like to, to what degree can they change uh, things internally, like the orbit format specifically. Um, and you know, Matt Holman was quite happy to go ahead and do that, and you know, being 
being met, he immediately started devising what is the optimal way to, to encode uh, uncertainties for, for Kuiper Belt objects and so on. So that's a process that I think it will take a, on order of a year or so, and we need to manage it. We need to make sure that there's a loop between MPC and the project and the collaboration to, 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 to make this into something that's as useful, as broadly useful as possible so that you folks perhaps don't need to continue um, you know, fitting your orbits. But I would, I would think about it, you know, this is, this is a case where um, you're, you're choosing, I would say, the best possible alternatives from, from a number of, of um, you know, potentially unsatisfactory choices. Um, the, the alternative would be that LSST tries to do something on our own um, with, in essence, no resources. Right, because the the idea is that the the LSST will not be um, you know actively um, housing a sizable solar system team to to understand the optimal formats and so on in operations. It's going to be a fairly automated operation to to make these data available and then for the community to take it up. Um, what we're trying to do here is to to make this data available in a, in a way that. Um, benefits as much as the community as possible and to push the, the community aspects, so let's say the MPC, um, to actually deliver beyond what they're delivering today and, and give you orbit catalogs that are um, that might be even directly useful for, for what you what you're trying to do. Because um, if you look at what we what we were going to deliver, it's actually a, a copy of of um, uh, what's it called um, of Astorb plus uh, error covariances, right? It's not that different from, from what uh, comes out in MPC org already. Um, it, so we're actually trying to make this better. Uh, yes, but I guess the thing is that we're not, I guess my worry is, is that you and the MPC, the MPC and project are talking, but we're not having, I guess, a closed loop with having the community involved in it. And so yeah. I can think of things for solar system, you might be thinking more about asteroids and how do we make sure we're all talking about it? Because I guess my worry is, is that and the worry has been is that the MPC has to scale up to a significant level and they've started and, you know, are they going to get there on time and what happens if they don't? Um, and so if they can't deliver orbits in 24 hours or, or in reasonable amount of time, what is going to happen and yeah. on day one? And so I think is maybe it's, it's I think having a, a more of these presentations to the, the SSC so that we can have these discussions because I guess that's all my questions of there's their action items, but um, even from the MPC, we're not hearing anything. Um, and I know they're part of the community, but they're one aspect, right? So JPL Horizons is another, but, and are they gonna be involved as much? And I, I get why you might select the MPC, but I think it's just a little bit of a surprise to hear that, that only in the yearly catalog will there be an orbit fit. Um, or it, sound, it sounds like that will be there will be an orbit fit in the yearly catalog, the annual release. Yeah, that, from, that's right. From I mean, I, I would say, I mean, we'll, we'll, it's definitely you know in, in kind of work time. This has happened. This has all happened last month. So there there seems like there's a there's a delay there, but um, it's uh, it's a loop that we're trying to to, to make as, as tight as possible, um, given the resources we have. And the, the the issue here, I think, is to think about. Um, Let's try to find a way to, to make what, what MPC is going to be doing for the community as useful to the as broad range of the community as possible. I know that you know, especially the asteroid folks are extremely excited about this. If if there's something that, that's problematic on the KBO side because of this change, we'll try to find a way to, to, to fix that um, as, as much as we can. Right. I think I, I think just to, I would suggest to project to really consider that if you're going to have these meetings, really think about having some representatives from the SSC in there as well, or afterwards giving us a summary. Because I guess my, right now my concern is that you guys we got a little bit in October, and then we haven't. This is the first time I've actually heard anything other than sort of watching your talk last week. Yeah. Um, so I think that's just yeah, something again, that, and I, generally, I, 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 I think is a concern. Yeah. I think the issue here is that um, you know we've had this 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 pause of work over the past six months. So it feels like it's been a long time with no communication. But in effect, in terms of work that has been done, this is effectively January for us, um, right? So so it's it's the month after the meeting, uh, and now we're putting out all those all those papers and so on. And I think that's something that I, I hope the collaboration can understand as well. You know, on a, on a project of this scale, sometimes we have to pause in certain areas and then continue later. Um, but but we one of the things that we really 
didn't do well is, is communicate that and uh, we'll, we'll try to work on that uh, better um, going forward. Yeah, I think at least in, in looking at them, most of them are my questions, I think at this point, um, is, you know, getting a timeline of all of this and it all written out. And I guess that my worry is, is that, um, and I think the same thing for both MOPS and everything else with data, all the data pipelines is, when do these actually come online? And I think that's that's part of this that I, I get the pauses and everything, but as we add new things or waiting for other people to then, or other ins community institutions to provide things that we also need to prepare for that. And we've been working in the last six months. And so just, I think if, if, if project in general can decide about how best to communicate these changes um, to the data structures and timelines, that would be really helpful. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but I just think that this is the first time the SSC is actually hearing any of this. Um, and so I, I hopefully would, we I can brainstorm about how to communicate that. Because that. It, was, it, was actually, it was actually presented in, 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 in October, and, and but, but fine. A little bit, but it wasn't finalized. So I don't think it was clear to me, and, and David might disagree of exactly how that was going to be worked out. So yes, you did discuss it, but it sounded like it was very preliminary. Um, where this sounds much more sort of thought out and and, and final. Um, so I just if we I think just in terms of moving forward, if we can figure out ways of of communicate, it sounds like solar system has a lot of development to do in terms of pipeline and data formats of just if we can if if, if there are timelines and and dates that helps us uh, prepare and start writing software to know what the new MPC format will be and things like that, and whether or not well, the MPC is willing to give us. A, uh, allow the community to give input. So I don't see any other specific questions. Um, there was one that was just asked if, uh, um, will the MPC be uh, supported throughout all of LSST? So it is, um, I answered that, but I guess you might have a better answer for, since they are a separate institution, um, are they going to be commit to being funded and, they, and providing this for the 10 years? They have been designated by, by NASA as a major, I think the term is node, um, uh, to, to support their um, um, asteroid or, or um, uh, solar system exploration mission. They have a five-year contract that um, is, um, we have no reason to believe it's not going to be extended. Um, so I, I think that the, the risk there is, is fairly low. Um, at least that's, that's uh, after studying what, what they've told us. I think that's, uh, that's kind of my assessment of it. Um, and just historically, they've been around for uh, for already a couple of decades, much longer than LSSD itself. Are there any other questions? Um, I think there's one more. If the data release orbit catalog does not include info from the MPC, will there be a distinction between LSST and MPC catalogs? Um, uh, I guess in yes. terms of it sounds like in terms of the data release, but yes, I just yeah. want to understand. The data release, right. Sorry, say, say it again. Yeah. So the context of this is that you made the strong point that for that the MPC and LSST uh, catalogs will be identical, but that will not be true for the for the data releases. Correct. Am I, am I saying release. that right? Correct. The data release catalog is is a completely um, um, separate. It's completely separate from LSST uh, from from uh, MPC, and in, in fact, it will cause some um, you know, curious um, artifacts in that catalog. In that, we probably won't have the brightest asteroids in it. Right. <laughs> they, will, they will saturate. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, let's thank Mario. Thanks very much for the All right, Mario. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'll uh, put these slides uh, somewhere on DocuShare and, uh, and I'll let you know where, uh, where they are and I'm uh, happy to, to, to take questions and, and feedback on this. I think this is uh, extremely useful to us as we're, as we're trying to, uh, to, to put this together into a product that uh, you know, we can deliver. Mario, you can send slides to me because they are supposed to be linked together with the recording at the scientists page on lsst.org. All right, will do. Thank you, Mario.
Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.